Josh from Multiversity here for the second year in a row at New York Comic Con with Mr. Jeff Lemire. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Long weekend, long weekend. So, a brand new arc just started in Sweet Tooth, and you're working with, uh, if the internets are to be believed, your good friend Matt Kent. How has that been? Matt's a total fucking asshole. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can we swear on this? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, Matt's my, one of my best friends, so it's, it's really fun to work with him. And, uh, I mean, it's just completely natural. It's so easy to write a script for him, because I know exactly how he works and how he draws and stuff. But um, it's a really fun arc, because... It's an arc that really lends itself to another artist coming on because it's a big flashback to uh, a whole new cast of characters at the beginning of the 20th century. And at first, it doesn't seem connected at all to our regular you know, Sweet Tooth mythology. Especially that first issue, I think, was a bit jarring for people. But as the next two issues kind of unfold, you'll see that it has huge repercussions for the, for the bigger story I was always telling. And um, you'll see it connect to the modern day cast in, a, I think, a really surprising way. And then basically it's the big reveal of what the plague is or how it started. Um, and it sets up, you know, and then we'll jump back. Obviously, I'll come back on in issue 29. And it, uh, and it just sets up sort of the second half of the big Sweet Tooth story and gets things rolling and moving towards the end. So. I mean, it did seem a little bit disconnected, but you're not a writer known for putting in anything that doesn't matter somewhat. Oh, yeah. And yeah, really yeah. quickly, and everything that seemed disconnected in issue one will suddenly, it'll make sense, so, yeah. I think. I hope. How, uh, how far along in the process was it uh, established that Matt would be drawing this arc, and have you been writing it for him in a way? No, not really. It was uh, it was something I was gonna actually. This arc was never a part of the big sweet tooth story I had planned originally. Um, I can't remember. Just one night, I got this idea of how I could tie some de disparate ideas I had together using this storyline, this flashback, and I was gonna draw it. But I'm, as you guys know, I have another. I had a graphic novel for Top Shelf that called The Underwater Welter that. I'd been working on off and on for about two and a half years, and with all my DC commitments and Sweet Tooth, I just never had time to really dive into it and, and finish it. And uh, so I talked with my editor, and we thought this would be a good way for for me to get a break from Sweet Tooth, finish my other book, and get sort of get that commitment off my plate, and then to have to work with Matt and have him come in and do it. So it all kind of worked out well for me, you know, timing-wise and scheduling and stuff. Yeah. So there's been. Um a couple rumors, bits of information going around that you're plotting the issue, uh, the series out rather, until around issue 45 or 48 or so, somewhere around 50, yeah. um, which means you're about at the halfway point. Yeah, Do you feel like halfway? I think it's it's probably going to end up being leaning closer to 40 than 50. So, yeah. do you feel that you are structurally in a place you want to be for a halfway point? Yeah, I mean, it's right where I want it to be. It's everything. I feel like the first, what I've done now is from the issue one until this point is sort of the world building and the setting everything up. And now it's the fun part where I get to pay all that stuff off. So it's kind of like the downward slope of all the cool stuff I've had planned and finally get to draw and stuff. So I, I'm excited for that. Yeah. yeah. Moving into Frankenstein and the uh, Agent of Shade. Uh, how you're taking obviously a very dense mythology developed by Grant Morrison. How was it like picking up uh, all those plot lines? And it, it was clear from your first issue that you're bringing you're bringing yourself into it, if only because you're having Ray Palmer appear in the book. And and in what other ways uh, have you kind of made this property your own? Um, I, I think Grant's thing was really exciting, but what I really like. What I loved about it as a reader was it was like was it three issues or four? I can't remember four. It was four. Right, yeah, four issues. Part of the Seven Soldiers thing, and it just sort of hinted at a bigger mythology for Frankenstein and for Shade stuff, but you never really saw a lot of it. And that that sort of tease was what was so exciting. So they really there was a lot of room for me to interpret what Shade is and what his role in Shade is. Um, but I think the way I made it my own was to bring in the, the creature commandos and make make them this weird dysfunctional family of freaks, you know, and uh, that's obviously the kind of stuff I love to do, so, um, and I always loved those characters back in the, you know, in the 80s and 70s when I was reading Weird War Tales and stuff, and so this was really a chance for me to kind of do my take on the, the, those guys and tie it in with that, that mythology, mythology Grant had started and, and hopefully make a really big, fun sci-fi action-adventure book, you know, so. So, uh, prior to the first issue landing as part of the New 52, you had the Frankenstein and the Creature Commandos, uh, the Creatures of the Unknown, of the Unknown rather, uh, tie into Flashpoint. How much of that miniseries is sort of, I guess, I don't want to use the word incontinuity, but that's sort of what I mean. How much of that uh, world building and character building will apply to the new book? 
Yeah, it's funny. It was almost like a practice run more yeah. than anything. You know, I tried some things. Some of it I liked. I really liked the character of uh, Nina Mazursky that I created, the bog woman or the mermaid or whatever you call her. Um, I liked her a lot. Some other things I tried I thought worked well within the miniseries but wouldn't work you know, on an ongoing basis, like the love story between her and the werewolf and stuff. I thought it was nice for the miniseries, but I didn't want to do that again. In the... So it was almost like I got to pull the things I liked that I did, but kind of start over again and get a redo. <laughs> and uh, so that was kind of fun, actually. Yeah, so. so how did you go about uh, fleshing out, other than the creature commandos, how did you go about deciding who would be a member of Frankenstein's supporting cast and what do you think they bring to the book? Um, well... I don't know. It was like it was a mixture of bringing a couple new characters like Nina, and then doing modern takes on the Commandos, and then using what Grant had and mixing it all together. So I knew it was going to be a big cast. The Ray Palmer factor didn't come in until I was kind of building what Shades headquarters would be and stuff. And I, I had done this thing in my Adam stories with the ant farm, and I thought, oh, that would be really cool, you know. And and uh, it all, you know, the whole book is just like throwing as many things together as you can and try to make it fun and big and exciting. So that, that's really the cast was just to make it big and unwieldy and, you know, uh, it's a, just such a fun book to write. So, yeah. so with the inclusion of Ray Palmer, I guess the question that a lot of people are asking is how much of his history of the Atom still applies in this uh, new rebooted universe? In, in the new DCU or whatever you call it, he's not become the Atom yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh... As far as we know, at this point, he's only sort of the scientist who's loosely associated with the UN. Uh, he's kind of like the watchdog for the UN, keeping an eye on Shade's mad science, you know. Um, and I think we'll see as the uh, as the book progresses, either in in Frankenstein or possibly in some other titles, we'll see Ray become the Adam eventually, I would presume. Um, although I, I, it's not my plan to do that right away. I kind of like him. I like keeping him as a scientist for now, you know. So. Uh, but I'll probably set it up in a way that he can be picked up by another writer and then they can they can do this new version of the Atom the way they want. Or, or maybe he'll never become the Atom in the new DCU. That's the other kind of exciting thing about that character is maybe he'll just stay this cool scientist with these awesome inventions and stuff and someone else can be the Atom. So, you know, who knows? It's kind of cool. I mean, DC does need some cool scientists. Marvel kind of has uh, the leg up on them That's on that. I always felt about the Atom that's so untapped. And I don't think I really got to it in my in my in when I was writing it because it was my, the first thing I had written for DC and I... And, uh, you know, like any time you do something for the first time, I was really learning as I went, but if I could go back and take a, do another take on him, it would be to make him kind of DC's Reed Richards, you know, like their go-to science guy, because we don't really have one, and I think he has that potential, you know, so. Moving into Animal Man. Uh, as a character that, it, it, was, it was striking to me in a good way, that as a character, Animal Man, for many years since Grant Morrison's run, has become kind of this counterculture cultural icon, both for his established political beliefs, his his stance on animal rights, um, and when you when you started off the book right off on the first page with the the prose article, uh, you kind of established his identity as a countercultural icon as a part of the character within the book, and I guess what was your motivation for bringing in that element? I don't know. I just I don't know where that came from. I just felt like. It was a really cool way. Well, you know, originally the Buddy Baker character was a stuntman in Hollywood, and who um, he got these powers and became like a superhero. So he always had kind of that element to him, where even though he was a superhero, he had sort of this weird celebrity kind of element to his character and stuff. And and that was just sort of my my modernized version of that. And you know, bringing in the sort of the animal rights, political kind of views and stuff that Grant did, and and uh, so instead of doing it as like a you know, Hollywood stuntman or just like a straight up actor. He became more like this kind of hipster, you know. It just seemed like a modern version of doing that kind of a thing with him, you know. And also, like Grant obviously did that, the crazy metafiction stuff where he became a character in the book and everything. And I thought this is kind of my way of kind of putting like a metafictional spin on that character, is to kind of have him kind of re reflect our celebrity culture and our uh, sort of the media, social media, and stuff of today, and and bring that into the book and into the characters. So. It's really clear that the theme of family is something you are working very heavily with in the book. And I guess, in your words, how important are the Bakers to the overall story that you're writing? I, there is no character of Animal Man without his family. Like, uh, you know, you can boil every superhero, every character down to their core. And if you take the family element away from Animal Man, there's absolutely nothing about that character that makes him special or worth writing. Because he's just a guy you can 
take on the power of animals and that after like an issue or two it's completely boring and pointless like he what makes him a unique and worthwhile character is that he's is that it's a book about family and about his family um, as much as it is, is about him and and that you know there's really no other superhero who has children and has a wife and uh, has that kind of a relationship that's lasted for 20 years or 30 years or however long he's, he's been around and um, uh, yeah that's just who he is his family is the character so it's 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 completely important to the book yeah. So wrapping up, moving forward with the book, you and Scott Snyder have both announced that uh, the connections between your book and Swamp Thing are going to become more apparent and build to a Dead World crossover, I think it's what you call it. Um, why is Animal Man and Swamp Thing hadn't necessarily been connected before as characters very much. Why? What is it about the characters that makes them rife for uh, a crossover like that? Well, I mean, there's two things. First of all, Scott and I are really close friends, and we talk all the time about our stories, and we help each other with our stories and bounce ideas off each other. So just naturally, us doing these two books at the same time, ideas started to, you know, crossbreed, and it, so it just became something we, we were working on before we even realized we were working on it. And, uh, but the characters themselves, there's this common ground of, you know, Swamp Thing's always been this this elemental, of the green or whatever, right? And then vice versa, Animal Man of the Red. So it was just obvious that they needed to, if we were building this new DC universe, those two elements had to be connected with those two characters. And um, So both, you know, grew out of the characters themselves and it grew out of Scott and, Z Scott and my own, uh, you know, willingness to work together and our friendship and stuff. So it just sort of seemed natural, you know. Exciting, exciting stuff. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. Have a good day.